Welcome to the Smart Connector Group and the Smart Connector Podcast. Um, it's the Thursday evening. We go live every Thursday evening, and I have another wonderful guest for you tonight, Ashley McManus. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So Ashley is a tech marketing lead, currently serving as a senior director of global marketing for SmartEye, which specializes in eye tracking software solutions. And with over 10 years of B2B tech marketing experience, Ashley was part of the branding team that led to the successful exit of startup Affectiva for $76.5 million uh, dollars in 2021. So that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, as a speaker at multiple events, conferences and conventions, Ashley has positioned herself as a thought leader in the marketing space. And she also hosts her own podcast, the Human Centric AI Podcast, which is really amazing. So uh, if you're interested in AI and its impact on us people, then check it out. Now, what we're going to talk about with Ashley tonight is how to produce content that will build your authority and help you stand out as a thought leader in your space. And we're also going to talk about how to repurpose your content in order to amplify that authority and get your ideal prospects or customers to choose you first. So if that's OK with you, Ashley, we'll just get into it. That sounds great. I'm ready to talk. Amazing. Amazing. So, Ashley, before we we get into talking about content, um, love to hear a little bit more about your journey. So how did you end up in this role? Have you always been passionate about marketing or where? Tell us tell us all about your journey. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I actually graduated with a BFA from Tufts University in, in 2010. Um, and I had a minor in entrepreneurial leadership. So uh, as part of that, I, I took a marketing class and I knew that I wasn't quite destined for, I guess, the fine arts track. Like I was a little too academic for it. And I just sat in that marketing class and I realized, you know, this this kind of marries the the creative interests that I have with the more practical, pragmatic kind of business sense. And I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, and then since then, I, like you said, I've been mostly in B2B tech startups in a little over 10 years now. I really enjoy kind of building stuff up from scratch. And uh, I, I've been I think I'm in my sixth role, I want to say. And it's just been interesting kind of building up, you know, marketing and what that means and what that looks like. And I definitely learned a lot over the years. And, you know, marketing also is one of those kind of tricky, tricky fields that always changes. There's lots of different technologies and applications, but I am excited to talk a little bit more about content because that's definitely a, a thread that continues over time. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I have a, um, a creative background as well. And I think, um, you, you mentioned your fine arts, um, your fine arts kind of studies and so on. But I think that um, it is content is a lot about creativity, isn't it? Don't you think that um, actually that discipline of studying that has stood you in good stead? I, I mean, I certainly feel feel that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's definitely also given me an edge in even interviewing because people are like, oh, you went to school to art school. What's that about? And I can kind of explain how I got here. But also, yeah, to your point, I mean, you know, I guess artists have a different way of kind of thinking about things and looking at them. And especially with something like content, you know, being a, a more creative minded person, I think it's easier to maybe brainstorm or being creative about what's out there and what you have written or what you could write. So mm -hmm. it, just, it just makes it come a little bit easier, which I know is challenging to some people. So I'm, I'm happy to talk through some strategies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think the interesting thing about, uh, about being a creator is that you learn pretty early on that some people are just not going to like what you do. And that's OK, because because actually many artists, are, well, any creators of any kind really are going to produce stuff that, of course, they like, but other people might not might not appreciate in the same way. So I think we have to get over that stuff really early. And so when we go into the content space and we actually start creating stuff, we're OK with that, really, aren't we? And I think a lot of people do struggle with that 
that mm-hmm. that fear of um, am I going to be approved of? Um, what do you think about that, Ashley? Yeah, that's a great point. So I would say it definitely it lends itself to to making you have a really thick skin. So, I mean, if you are to put something out there and you you kind of get the flack back of, you know, okay, that didn't go over so well. So you can only do that so many times before you're like, okay, moving on, we'll try something else. Yeah. Um, And also I would say, I I, I wouldn't want to discourage people from trying to be authentic and and kind of taking taking a perspective or a stand on something because often I find that content is the the kind that performs the best um yeah. like, like getting personal or telling a personal story like in your mind you're like oh I can't talk about that that's not professional but uh like on my podcast or I write personal blogs too and you know those far outperform something like very dry, like, you know, tips on how to do this, or this is how you should do that. Um, (laughs) Apply a personal story to it. You know, people are, everyone's a human that also has a story. So I think it really, it really resonates them to see that. Yes. Uh, So what kind of personal blogs do you like to write about, Ashley? Do you have any particular topics that you're particularly passionate about or known for? Yeah, absolutely. So I am really big on, um, working moms and empowering women. So because I myself am a working mother of two, and I've found, especially in my personal career journey, there's a lot of, you know, obstacles, frustrations, and especially with, um, you know, the great resignation for the last couple of years, I I feel like so many women just left the workforce. And uh, I, I just, I wish there was some way to, to get us back, you know? So um, I, I like to write about, you know, different tools, different strategies, different ways to think about and approach these different challenges. And um, I try to encourage other women that are maybe feeling like burnt out, like this is, these are some tactics you can do to apply to your own life to maybe help with that. Um, so those are some, some of my personal uh, stories. And again, I, I've written about them and they've really blown up on, on LinkedIn whenever I share them. So many people are like, this speaks to me. I really love this. So it's been very encouraging for me to keep up that work. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, do you think they might turn into a book one day? Oh, I would love that. Really? <laughs> really? The dream is to write a book because I, I read way too many of them. So yes. To really? Uh, you got to do it, Ashley. <laughs> yes. Oh. So, so just before we get into talking about, about more about content, um, so you, you mentioned uh, that you're very passionate about, about working moms. Obviously, my audience are entrepreneurs. A lot of them are early stage solopreneurs. A lot of them are women as well as men. Mm-hmm. And um, so what, what are the challenges um, of, that women face in terms of combining that role of being a mom, maybe having those young children with entrepreneurship or, or marketing, a mm-hmm. career in marketing. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think one of the biggest challenges is that the idea that I, I mean, I kind of hate is the the balance and you have to, you know, somehow, you know, balance it all. And to me, it's been so much easier to just realize that they will never be a balance. <laughs> some days I'll be a really great mom and some days I'll be a really great employee. Some days I just need to take a day off. Um, so I think the, the all that pressure of just like I have to be on and I have to be perfect in all these different areas of my life it's not sustainable, right? So I think, at least for me, I realized this, I think the, the pandemic really forced it because someone like me is a very you know, work ethic oriented person who also wants the best for my kids. You know, I'm also a person that is really fulfilled working. So I want to continue working. So I had to figure out a way to, to make them more fit together versus find that balance, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. You know, funnily enough, as you were talking, I, I was just remembering about three years ago, I was in LA and I met this great lady called Carith Foster. And in fact, I did interview her for the podcast as well. But she wrote this book called You Can Be Perfect or You Can Be Happy. And uh, I thought, I mean, that one down. <laughs> yeah, and that was just like, I've got to I've got to have this this lady on my podcast, because that was what her movement and her mission was all about. It was like, sorry, you know, you've got to choose. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're brought up to think, I think, as as women, I mean, obviously, I'm older than you. But, you know, generally, the message is you can have it all. 
And the truth is, well, you can have it all, but there's a price to pay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, you could be perfect or you could be happy. <laughs> gonna, I wrote it down. I'm going to read it. <laughs> yes. And, and have you settled for being perfect or being happy, uh, Ashley? Oh, oh, happy. A thousand percent. I, once, once, I, once I let go of that, you know, real desire to be perfect, I just felt like a weight just got lifted off. And obviously, again, the pandemic and, you know, forced flexibility and, and all this stuff, like it kind of in a way made it slightly easier. But I mean, once yeah. you release that and often self-inflicted expectation of yourself, I feel like you can just open up to so much more happiness and fulfillment and, you know, realize what brings you joy and making sure you're working that in too. So um, definitely. So let's get into the main topic for tonight, which is which is content. So um, so we're talking about thought leadership. So first of all, Ashley, why is thought leadership important? Does it really matter? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it definitely matters. So first of all, I would say that, you know, putting my marketing hat on content is really helpful for SEO, which you might've heard of as, as an entrepreneur. So, you know, constantly putting out new content is super helpful for search engines, making sure that you're ranking for the, the keywords you want to be ranking for. So yes, in that very basic sense, it matters, right? So in addition to those strategies, I would say that you know, thought leadership content is really just thinking of yourself as an expert and the way in which you communicate that that expertise to your target audience, your target customers. And um, it really aligns yourself with, you know, this is how this is what I know how to do. This is how I can help you. And it also helps people along that 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 buyer journey, the consumer journey, and and ultimate. Yes, it would be excellent if they bought from you. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And and optimizing content to that purchase is is what will be successful for you in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, so you said optimizing content to that purchase, and I think you also made another important point, which is that. You know, some people just like to consume, don't they? They might be they might be avid followers of what you do, but they're never going to buy from you. And mm -hmm. that's OK. Or is it? I think it's OK, because even if they don't buy, if they're following you and consuming your content, I would also consider them evangelists. You know, maybe they're not in the market for the thing that you're doing but they know someone who is, you know, and you have to check out this person. They wrote this blog or they did this video and I think you would be interested. So I wouldn't necessarily discount the, the evangelist. I think that they're definitely very powerful um, people and worth looking into. Yeah, uh, that's a really important point. And I mean, I know that I'm, I'm an evangelist. Um, I have some people that I follow on YouTube. I'm not going to buy anything from them. But if somebody says to me, you know, I want to launch a YouTube channel, I say, oh, you've got to look at this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, OK, I, I think we were talking beforehand, Ashley, and saying that some people get confused because what they do is they find that when they talk about their personal life or something that is unrelated to what they do, that sometimes they get a lot more likes and follows and even shares. Um, so a lot more engagement than if they are actually talking about something that they are an expert in, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on platforms like LinkedIn. Um, so, so I've noticed that there's a trend towards people they call it Facebooking, but, you know, it's it's more the kind of personal stuff as opposed to the business stuff. And I think people get very confused by that and they just think that they ought to post a lot more personal stuff and really not talk about their business at all. Um, so what do you think about that? Should we be more rounded and should we be, uh, you know, just talking about about our views on certain things, our values um, or do we, it is it really, really important to actually get that thought leadership piece in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you, you touched on a lot of different ideas, right? So I think I, I wouldn't just post personal for the sake of posting personal. You know, I, I don't feel like you need to put that much pressure on yourself. Like, oh, I need to share my entire life on, on Instagram. <laughs> That's not what I'm advocating for. for. For me, I think it's more about, okay, this is my business. 
maybe there's an example of something in my life where I can apply this, this core principle of my business to an everyday example. So I think in that sense, you're kind of creating a personal story that's easily, it's more easily accessible to someone versus just sharing business update, business update. Like I, and I think there's a, a place for, you know, like the regular, the press releases and, you know, we, we publish this great technical blog. I think there's a place for that, but I also think, you know, taking it down to that basic human level of telling a story. We hear a lot about storytelling and marketing, mm -hmm. like how can you take that? And maybe it's a personal story, but I think that is, is where, you know, I don't want people to get confused or overwhelmed, but I think if you can latch on to that element of it, I think it, it's a little bit more digestible versus just sharing your whole life on, on Facebook. Yes. And I think, I think you're so right about stories because we all resonate with stories. We've all grown up with stories, haven't we? And there's, there's something about them that they kind of send the brain into a trance, don't they? So it's like, oh, this is a story. Great. And then we're just like, oh, I'm just going to relax and take it all in and we don't do that when we're when we're being when we're subjected to different types of content there's just something special about stories isn't there mm -hmm. absolutely and, and another point i would say that you you touched on was you know your your company and your values and this is what we stand for i know also in the last couple of years a lot of brands put a lot of effort into trying to communicate you know this is what we're doing to help you know this is why we feel this is important. So we're doing this initiative. So I think, you know, you have to be, there, there's a fine line before, again, just, just saying it and actually doing it. Um, but, you know, people are looking for com companies that are, you know, holding themselves accountable, that are doing things that are responsible. They, they, they want to invest in companies that are, are making the world a better place, I think. So I think there's an element of that also when you're thinking about content and how you can share your story with the world. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important point. And particularly in the field of employment, I have a daughter who's in her mid 20s. And so she's a millennial so um, that she's in that category. And uh, I know amongst her and her friends how important it is to be working for a business that they feel aligns with their values. And she was working for a big multinational before. And she was really, really turned off to that company by the end because there were a number of things that they did, but one of them was that they didn't promote women. And so she would look up and she was like, you know, I, I don't see me up here. I don't see it. I, I'm doing the very best I can. I'm just as smart as him, but he's the one that's going to get promoted. And it was really quite obvious. And you think that this doesn't happen, well, but it does, does, doesn't it? 100%. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I, I also, I think I'm technically a millennial. I think I'm like at the end of it or whatever the, the definition is, but from, from my perspective, and I don't know if it's because I have kids, I have two daughters. I don't know if it's, it's because I'm thinking it from them, but if I were in a similar situation and I, I certainly have been like, that's why I'm pushing to, to be there and be like, okay, this is why you need to promote me. Look at the top. There's, there's no diverse, you know, views of, you know, how are you going to promote women or how can you hire women if you have no women to look up to in, in management? So yeah, I've been really lucky to have uh, quite a few um, executive female uh, leaders and mentors at my companies that I've been able to look up to. So I would want to also pass that down to, to the next generation too. Yeah. And, and you, you work for a, a progressive tech startup and funnily enough, so does my daughter because that's where she ended up because I think the views tend to be with startups. They tend to be a lot more agile, don't they? They're more forward thinking. They're often, you know, bucking the trend in lots of different ways, aren't they? So that really is the appeal, isn't it? Of working for those types of companies. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so let's start to um, talk about this issue of repurposing as well, because you know it's very easy, isn't it? If you're gonna if you're gonna start producing a lot of content, you can you could easily spend all your day um, doing it, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. uh, if you think, well, okay, I have to be present on this platform, that platform, and the other platform, and then it's like, oh, I have to create a piece of a piece of bespoke content for every platform, but it's not really an efficient use of time, is it, Ashley? Right. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I would say, and I, I am not, especially if you're a small company, I'm not advocating you need to be on every single platform. You know, I think this is also where understanding your, your customer and your user and where they go to consume content and prioritizing that. So for example, I'm a B2B tech startup. We care mostly about what our, our customers are on LinkedIn, you know? So we, we, we do have like a, a Facebook and an Instagram presence and we have a couple other platforms, but we're not as worried about updating something every single day or three times a week on those platforms. You know, we'll, we'll do a little bit here or there, but we know where our focus is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, and so, um, so in terms of those other platforms, would you say it's really just having a placeholder presence in a way that is needed? Somehow. I mean, I also think I'm, I'm not to, you know, downplay the importance of it because I think, you know, for our example, we have, we focus a lot on LinkedIn because that's where we see the best engagement. We see that where our customers are there. So we're really thoughtful about what we put out there, but we also know that geographically, a section of our customer base is very heavy users of like Facebook, for example. So mm -hmm. the type of content that we put out is very, very different than LinkedIn. So if you can, and again, this is kind of understanding your, your following, your, your network, you know, where people are, what they care about and kind of building out your, your content strategy around that. So you don't have to put you don't have to be everywhere and you don't need to put the exact same thing on every channel and you don't have to be as frequent with every channel. It's mm -hmm. it's really about understanding your your customers and your users and where they are and what they care about. Yeah, yeah. And quality over quantity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, you made an interesting point about Facebook versus LinkedIn, because obviously LinkedIn is the B2B platform globally. Um, but Facebook is huge, isn't it? And really, everybody's on Facebook. I mean, very well, I suppose there are some some people who aren't. But on the whole, most people are on Facebook. So how would you say your strategy differs on Facebook in terms of the, perhaps the tonality of, of what you're talking about or your your approach, Ashley? Yeah, definitely. So I think for us, um, and, and I'll use a continue our example. So we have we have an office in Cairo, Egypt, and we noticed that in our, our social following, our our Facebook followers are mostly based in, in Cairo, Egypt. For some reason, that's the platform that's used there. So that tells us, okay, what type of content were, are these people interested in? Um, and our, our CEO, Dr. Ronald Kalyubi, is from Egypt. So there's a lot of that. That's kind of the thread of connection there. So what that tells me as a marketer is, okay, if we are going to hire in Egypt, let's definitely prioritize this, this channel, this group. Um, and anything about Rana, like what she's doing, where she's speaking, if she's got an article out, we always post it there as well. So again, that's a little bit more of, of understanding your audience and what they care about versus our LinkedIn audience, which is more of our, our, our target customers are there. We have investors that are there. So whenever we have a press release, for example, we'd definitely put that out on LinkedIn. We might put it on on Facebook, but I'm not as as I'm not prioritizing it as highly as you know that that type of content on on LinkedIn. Yeah, and you made an important point about where are your customers because um, it's very important to actually be able to track and use analytics and data, isn't it, to identify that? So, do you spend time doing that, Ashley? Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially with content, and then at the the volume of content, because ideally you're you're producing on a fairly regular basis, right? So, and the worst thing you can do is just put content out there and never understand how it performed, right? Or how people are engaging with it. So for me, that's also, and, and I'm not doing it every single day. Like I think our biggest things are our monthly, we'll, we'll just take a look, but also on a quarterly basis, we do a real deep dive. Like, okay, this is everything we did. We wrote about, we posted in the last three months. And what I'm looking for there is what was successful, what resonated with people. And then I'm going to take that, and continue that in my planning for my next quarter and my next month, because that that's kind of how, at least for me, and I'm, I'm all about backing stuff up with data, 
that's how I really shape my strategy. And I get granted that I work for a lot of startups and I know people plan out things a year in advance, but I'm really about like, okay, this is, it's kind of day to day, like things change on a daily basis. The market changes, like, what can we talk about today? That was super successful that we can try to replicate that success tomorrow. Yeah. Um, what do you think about news jacking, Ashley? Do you do much of that? Yeah, I think it's great. Um, it, we try to, um, if we have a, a piece that's that comes across that's super relevant, we try to get, you know, our CEO or another executive that can kind of jump on it, form an opinion and put a post out there. So um, I, I am all for news jacking if you have the, the expertise <laughs> and the bandwidth to kind of whip something out real quick. Yeah, yeah, because it's you, you're following the zeitgeist, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't advise a 24-7 newsjacking policy, but, you know, <laughs> if something comes up, I think it's definitely worth jumping on and maybe deprioritizing other things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, well, let's talk about podcasting now, Ashley, because you're a podcaster and you we talked before and you've been podcastering for around three years, haven't you? Yeah. And we were talking just before we started about Clubhouse because we both had a bit of a flutter on Clubhouse and we, we were both saying that the thing about Clubhouse is that you might be having some really interesting conversations with some really interesting people, but when it's done, it's gone. And the thing about podcasting that I'm certainly very passionate about is that you can build up that wall of content that people can discover you and they can go back and they can binge consume your your content if they like it. And that, that's I mean, that's great from the point of view of building up that credibility and that authority. And, and as you said, that thought leadership, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you hit on a couple of different things I'd love to expand on. So back to the, you know, knowing your audience and know where they are. There's definitely a, a, a group of people that are super into the clubhouse. And if that is your target audience, by all means, you know, yeah. the time on clubhouse, uh, we were just talking because, you know, as marketers, as people that like to reference things and not let our work go to waste, so to speak, um, the, the clubhouse thing just wasn't just wasn't jiving for us. Right. So um, it, definitely understanding who your, your target market is, is super important. Um, and, you know, for, for podcasting, I, I just fell in love with it a couple of years ago. I, I, this was an example. I just, I really enjoy podcasts. I love listening to them. And I yeah. just brought the idea to my boss and I was like, I, I think this could be really cool. Can I just do this and she was like sure go ahead <laughs> so I started like gathering people and interviewing them and I really loved it so we've over time kind of uh, built up this this following and this this initiative and uh we're almost at the the 10 000 downloads mark which I'm very proud of Ooh, that's wonderful congratulations thank you. thank you and you know I know we, we we talked about you know repurposing content like just because we put out a 20 minute episode doesn't mean that's it, you know? So we'll, we'll take that episode, we'll transcribe it, we'll write a blog about it. We've got um, the guests that I interviewed, we'll, we'll kind of package up a little uh, promo campaign for them so they'll promote it. So all of a sudden we doubled our, our reach in terms of how we're, we're getting the word out about our episode together, we're tagging each other. It's a great, you know, relationship builder. So um, in terms of, you know, again, this also ties back to to marketing in general and, and so many new tools are always coming out and trying all these different things and kind of seeing what works and then kind of building on and, and expanding that. Yeah. And it, as you said, it's an ever changing industry, isn't it? It's not like, uh, you know, if you're a, a lawyer, you th things move very, very slowly. If you're an accountant, things move pretty slowly and you don't have to. If you're a, a doctor, I guess things probably move quite slowly because the human body doesn't change much, does it? Mm -hmm. But as a marketer, we do have to invest a lot of our time and energy in actually staying ahead of the curve, don't we? So that we can add value to the people that we serve. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also marketers, they, there's never a level, I think, about being comfortable. <laughs> like, you no. should never feel like, okay, I've learned it all. I've done it <laughs> all. Uh, there is no more skills I need to master. I've figured it out. So uh, to me, also, if you're a marketer, like a constantly 
absorbing, learning, trying new things, not being afraid of failure because you're going to fail, but taking it as learnings and, and that kind of stuff too. So yeah, it's definitely a unique uh, industry and field to be in. Yeah. And that is also what makes it fun and exciting as well, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, so, oh, we're having, oh, wow, two smart, beautiful ladies. That's a nice comment, isn't it? Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Richard. Um, right. So, so, um, Ashley, um, just, in terms of Instagram, because we haven't we haven't talked about Instagram, which is also a very big platform. Do you do much on Instagram or, or is that kind of like Instagram is obviously linked to Facebook? So what do you feel about about Instagram? Yeah, Instagram, again, it's we, we do have a presence there, but we're not as, um, you know, all over it 24 seven. Uh, for us, we've discovered and again, this is looking at the performance. We've seen a lot more. The, the personal kind of behind the scenes more, this is what it's like to work here. Content works the best there. So we'll do like uh, if we have a, a work party or if we are all at a summer outing, like that's, that's kind of where we put all of that, that content. And it, mm -hmm. it is interesting for, you know, marketing for hiring, or if you're trying to get people on your team and understand what it's like to work somewhere, we found Instagram is a great tool for that. The mm. challenge with Instagram is also, um, you know, every every post you put out, you can't really link back. So if people want to read yeah. more, if they want to sign up or if they want to buy, I think you have to like link to the bio. So like the dynamics are a little bit different. But for our our company, definitely we've we've invested in and, in, you know, focusing on building up our brand there. But it's it's for it's kind of a different reason than those those other kind of networks. Yeah, yeah. Now, Rich is asking about artificial intelligence, machine learning and automation. And that is a topic that obviously you talk about that in your uh, podcast, don't you? Human centric AI podcast, uh, Ashley. So. Um, so, OK, let's let, let's get on to it. OK, how is AI and machine learning affecting marketing and how is it going to change marketing in the future? I mean, this is a really interesting topic, isn't it? Because it's big, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I am by no means like a machine learning expert. I, I interview them and they're the smart people. Uh, I'm just the marketing person that tries to, to, to communicate what they're trying to say. Um, so when it comes to, to, I guess, AI and marketing, for me, I think some of the opportunities are, and I think my CEO said this really well, was AI is a, is a tool that can be used to kind of eliminate the more mundane tasks. And I mean, everybody has a very mundane, very easy thing that probably takes a lot more time than it should. So as a marketer, if I could spend more of my time being more creative and strategizing and, you know, doing all the stuff that I like to do, if I could get an AI to take the more tactical kind of easier stuff off my plate, that's the stuff that I get really excited about. So, you know, I know there's like all the, the, the fear of AI is taking our jobs. Like I, I, maybe there's some of that, but I also think if we can look at it more as an opportunity to, you know, focus on the more human things, the things that I, I really like and that I'm passionate about. Like, yeah, if an AI can deal with my calendar and, you know, write something that I just am struggling with. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> you know, so um, I, I, and again, I'm not an expert on AI for marketing, but that's kind of how I, I think about it. Yeah. And uh, it, it is such a fascinating topic, isn't it? And I did a talk not so long ago at an investor show in London, and I was sharing the stage with somebody who writes a lot of articles and books and things. And he was saying, I love Jarvis, this uh, copywriting, AI copywriting tool. Mm -hmm. And so I was there with some of my clients and I was speaking to one of them today and he said, I've been experimenting. He's a tech guy. He said, I've been experimenting with Jarvis. And um, 
he said, I, I wrote a load of rubbish quite badly and, and put it through Jarvis to see what happened and whether they came back with some kind of perfectly formed ar argument. And he said it was actually very disappointing. So I don't know if you've kind of experimented with any of those kind of, I mean, because Jarvis isn't the only one, but any of those AI copywriting uh, apps and, and what, what you think about them. I, you know, I haven't, it's been on my list forever to just take the time, like try one out. It's so funny. I, I find that like a total, it's a total tech guy approach. Like, okay, give me this thing and I'm going to break it. Right. Um, if I, if I, this is in theory, cause only because I do so much copywriting, if I could have maybe an AI tool to help out with something a little bit, like if I fed it enough of my past work, oh my God, like that could free up so much time. And also, like you said, you would you would see the output. So not it's not like you're blindingly allowing an AI to write and publish stuff. Like you'd still have to kind of look at it and say, okay, is this is this good or not? Um, so no, I don't have any experience with it yet, but I definitely want to. Yeah, and of course, AI is um, the algorithms that are driving um, social media platforms. They're AI driven, aren't they? So they are prioritizing content that people want to read, which I think is obviously behind um, this kind of rise of the more personal stuff, should we say, on LinkedIn. And, and it's to a certain extent, it's kind of out of our hands, isn't it? Because they're almost, I mean, we, we never really know, and I know that the algorithms are changing all the time, but um, essentially it, they're designed to promote the social platforms as social tools, really, aren't they, and as networking tools. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's just kind of fascinating, isn't it? Maybe that is to do with the kind of downgrading of the more businessy or salesy content because they're kind of thinking, well, you know, if this was a networking meeting, you wouldn't walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, I'm just launching this thing and it's great. And so um, I think it's very easy for us to kind of take things personally, but it's never personal, is it? That's the thing about it. machine learning. It's right. machines. They're robots, in, essentially, really, aren't they? Right, right. Exactly. And, and for me, I mean, there's so much content that's great, but there's also so much that's bad. So again, me kind of on the AI train of like, yeah, let's get rid of the bad stuff. I, I don't want to see the bad stuff, <laughs> like show me less of it. And I'm always the person that's like, show me less. I don't like this. <laughs> so I'm constantly giving them inputs to, to figure me out and what I like. But, you know, like you said, I mean, a lot of the, the personal stuff getting, getting through these machines, like I, I, figure there's a reason for that, right? So when you're when you're thinking about your content as an entrepreneur and and again tying it back to that that human element of it and what would make it stand out and what would make it interesting to someone, I think I think is really interesting. And I'm also interested to see, like you said, there's so much personal stuff on LinkedIn. I'm wondering if this is also a trend that we're gonna see kind of go away <laughs> in the next like years to come. Yeah, because, because uh, you know, I'm not really that interested in, I mean, seeing pictures of people's cute dogs who I don't know. Mm -hmm. If I know people, I, I like to see the pictures of their cute dogs or their holiday in Lapland or whatever, because it's like, oh, that's interesting. Because mm -hmm. that's, but, you know, when you, when it's a cold audience, really, um, right. that there is a limit, isn't there, to to our interest in that stuff. Um mm -hmm. So it, it it is interesting the way it is all panning out. And I, I'm particularly that you think it might be a trend and there might be like a swing back. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my perspective, I think we should all be entertaining. I think that we are entertainers. Yeah. I think content creators have to understand that that is part of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and I come from a media background. I, I worked in uh, global media agencies for around 20 years mm -hmm. before I scaled and sold a brand identity business to a U.S. communications group. So mm -hmm. I know that um, in those environments, you had to be entertaining. I mean, you had to be interesting at the very least if you right. weren't entertaining. Yeah. Um, otherwise you just wouldn't last. You wouldn't last five minutes. There was no room for boring people, no room for people who waffled on and on and on without making a point. Mm -hmm. It was the number one uh, criteria that you had to be able to express yourself and be relevant mm -hmm. to the people that you were talking to. And so 
I guess because I had a grounding in that um, environment, I felt that heavy weight of responsibility. And so when I go on to social media, I, I know I don't always succeed because who does? But I always feel, you know, I've got to provide some value. I've got to make it interesting or entertaining to people. Um, and we love to be entertained and distracted, don't we, by social media at the end of the day? Yeah, definitely. And I also think, you know, you hit on a, a great point about you know, how do I cut through the noise, right? Yeah. Especially people that I want to be getting my content. How do I, how do I stand out? So I think there, there should be a constant way of, of thinking about that and, and how you put yourself out there. But also, you know, on the other end, like you mentioned, you know, I don't really need to see a picture of your dog. If I don't really know you, like, like I, it's kind of weird, but also, uh, on the other side, I'm not going to put, hopefully I'm not putting out for every single post that I do dog picture, dog picture, dog picture, dog picture, you know? So ideally there is some sort of balance, you know, it's interesting maybe once in a while, but yeah, I, I don't want to see that. It's, you know, likening it to a, like you said, I think a cocktail party, like you're not going to talk about the same thing over and over again to different people, like people are going to get tired of you, right? So how can you <laughs> stand out and, you know, say something interesting and, and want people to continue having a conversation with you? Yeah, and, and it's okay to put, I mean, I've got a dog and, and I do put his picture on social media because he's kind of quite cute. You're he's cute. Quite, yeah. yeah. Cute. He's not here tonight. He quite often likes to likes to join in when I'm on Zoom. So he must have uh, must be a little bit tired. But <laughs> yeah, but it's it, as you said, it's forgivable every once in a while. Right. Yeah. Um, so Richard is saying uh, so he wants to, to us to talk about systems and processes and how is it important to have systems for marketing? Mm -hmm. Actually, I mean, I think I know the answer, but uh, yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I would say yes. So as a, a kind of a systems oriented person, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. I know some people, you know, thrive more on that, that structure. Um, so when it comes to, to content, I would naturally think of, you know, like an editorial calendar of, of this is, I, I want to post once a week um, per month and, you know, that's four blogs a month. So how do, how much time do I need? Who can I get them from? What are the topics on? So building out that structure, I think it's a lot easier than kind of running by the seat of your pants. Like, oh no, it's Friday and I haven't written a blog yet. And then there's panic and you try to whip something up and maybe it's not your greatest. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say like per your example earlier of like the news jacking, if you already wrote a blog or you already posted something and something else comes up, let's jump on it. And then that gives us some time next week to kind of breathe a little bit. And, you know, so it's, I guess it's a, a balance of that structure and kind of keeping a little bit of fluidity so you can kind of yeah. jump on things as they come up. So I think that's how I would think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, consistency is key, isn't it? Always, always with social media, it's consistency, isn't it? Because, Actually, I believe that, um, that again, talking about the algorithms, uh, that they favor people who are super consistent. Is yeah. that right? Yes, definitely. Especially for, I guess, for SEO, you know, not only do they favor people that are kind of regularly updating, but you're getting a fresh chance to, to rank for that content. And if you, you do that, you know, once a week for 52 weeks a year, that's 52 pieces of opportunities that you are to, to be seen as this, this domain expert. So yeah, definitely consistency is huge when it comes to content. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been such an interesting discussion. So I think that the message is coming through loud and clear that it is possible to raise your authority and your credibility by posting consistently and by talking about, um, you know, leading uh, topics in your industry, telling stories and um, even newsjacking topical posts and so on. But that consistency and that uh, presence on the, the main social media platform where your ideal clients hang out is key, really. So it's, it's not there's no huge mystery to it, is there, Ashley? It's just... Um, You've got to entertain and you've got to be relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So is there anything else before we go? Is there anything else that that you would really like to um, 
it, you know, convey as a message about about succeeding as a thought leader? On yeah, staff? I, I would just probably leave it with, you know, because I know despite this great conversation, there's still people that are like, yeah, but I don't have time or I, I just am not in this content. That's not how my brain works. So I think I would encourage those people and really anybody to just think about, you know, what you're doing throughout your day. And then in every, you know, customer conversation that you're having, every challenge that you're facing, what kind of opportunities for content you could come, you can kind of use, you know, like if you're answering a customer question via email and it's three paragraphs, that's totally basis for a blog, you know, or if you're having a conversation with an engineer and you're having a really cool like back and forth as to how to solve a problem, that would be a really cool blog, you know? So there's, there's lots of ways to get a little, again, getting creative as to, you know, taking what you're already doing and then just putting it out there, you know? So it doesn't have to be a starting from, from a blank, blank page every single day. Yeah, because people are nosy, aren't they? I mean, everybody's interested in other people's lives, aren't they? But they don't want the bland stuff. They want the stuff that the challenges and the, they want to know how people are actually meeting their challenges because we all have challenges, don't we? So in a way, um, the thing about, you know, just posting the, the, the blander stuff, we're denying people the, the luxury and the enjoyment of actually seeing us grapple with life, aren't we? Yes, absolutely. And that's the most interesting stuff usually. So don't be afraid of it, you know. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, well, it's been such an amazing conversation this evening, Ashley. I really wanted to thank you for, for coming here and just sharing your wisdom and experience with us. So um, what's the best way for people to um, connect with you if they'd like to? Yeah, definitely. So I, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, that's probably the, the easiest, you know, actually Osgood is my maiden name, McManus. Uh, connect with me, follow me there. Um, I also have a personal website and I blog there about <laughs> these topics regularly. So that is ashleyemcmanus.com or you can listen to my podcast. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you, Ashley. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, and you're in Boston as well, aren't you? I am. So, yeah, Boston. Boston in the US. Yeah. And actually 50% of my audience are in the US. So, um, so yeah, that's I love to have US <laughs> guests as well. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day there in Boston. And I will enjoy the rest of my evening here in the UK. Um, so hopefully see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was great.